Thank you for praying. Praying for uh, the missionaries puts everything in perspective, doesn't it? We pray for our people overseas. God bless you. My name is Greg. Uh, I graduated uh, in 1997. I was invited to come back here and speak, and I'm quite honored to do so. So it's good to see some familiar faces, for who, people who touched my life deeply as a student. I'd also like to especially say hello to Daniel Montañez, who is a, a student who's going to be doing his supervised ministry at our church, and Nikki Noel, who served with us, and dear friend Isaac, and many others who've touched base with my church. I come from Congregación León de Judá in Boston. Some of you say, you don't look very Spanish to me. And I often say, for those of you that know Spanish, that I am the gringo confundido de la congregación. I am the confused gringo trying to fake like I'm Latino. I don't fool anybody. But I do uh, have been adopted there as the associate pastor many, many years ago. And uh, they have tolerated and uh, been with me as I've grown into ministry and, uh, and learned how to serve the Lord in that context. A few years ago, we started an English ministry, which is also extremely multi-ethnic. I'm very proud of the fact that in a group of about 100 people that we have 27 different nations represented. And that doesn't count all the different ethnic diversity from in the U.S. We got New Yorkers, East West Coasters, square dancers from the Midwest, Southerners. And I'm also very uh, proud of the fact, hopefully in a good way, uh, that it's very diverse socioeconomically. Uh, we have a lot of people who come from our immediate neighborhood. The church is located right next to Boston Medical Center in in Boston, right off the Mass Ave exit, and uh, there's a, a lot of people in the neighborhood who are homeless. It was referred to in a documentary as Methadone Mile. I don't know if I like that title. <laughs> I know that the liquor store next to the church used to have the name Liquor Land. How's that for a negative prophecy, huh? It was replaced by a CVS. It used to sell poison. It now sells medicine. Praise the Lord. So things are changing, but a lot of people come from the neighborhood, and I'm very grateful that we have professionals as well as people who are working people, as well as people who are in transition, might not even have housing. So it's a real honor to come back. And uh, as I, I just have to say, I like what you've done with the place. It's really, it uh, helps me feel a little bit more at ease coming back here to speak in chapel. But uh, you know, it's interesting, as I was driving up here, I was uh, feeling a little sentimental as I was uh, uh, in traffic, but enjoying it, had plenty of time. And I was thinking about, as a student, for many students, things are very much in transition. Uh, I know for me and the, the generation that, that was here, my immediate circle of friends, you know, we were praying about our future. How are things going to work out? Where are we going to go? How, what kind of ministry are we going to do? I know I had a particularly hard time even finding a church that I felt like was the right fit for me, which was hard as a seminarian. You think the least I should be able to do is find a church, right? But, um, but over the years, things have worked out. And for 20 years, I've been able to serve as a pastor. And many of my friends are teaching, some of them you know, uh, here at, uh, at uh, Gordon-Conwell and uh, other places. And I was just thanking the Lord that God is good. He is able to work out our lives. And the reflection I want to bring today has to do with our uh, calling in ministry. Just the specialness of the privilege that we have to enter in to the intimacy of what God is doing in people's lives. The holiness of that role. So if you turn with me to Numbers chapter 20, we're going to read about a hard day in the ministry of Moses. We know that in ministry there will be good days and there will be hard days. Moses had a lot of hard days <laughs> in ministry. And this was a particularly low moment, but I believe it speaks to us in a positive way as well. Numbers chapter 20 verse 1 says, In the, month, in the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived in the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. And there Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died with our brothers when they fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. 
Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting and fell face down and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together, speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me, enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I have given them. And these were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord, and where he was proved holy among them. Let's pray together. Dear God, I thank you that you are the holy God. And Father, I thank you for the uh, the holiness of the moments into which you call us, in spiritual leadership. As we reflect on this text, Lord, I pray that the voice of the shepherd would speak to your people, that you would speak to my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you that have been in ministry a while know that sometimes people can um, complain. No? That does happen sometimes. If you haven't started ministry yet, I should probably break it to you. Sometimes people complain. It's what's happening here in the desert. As soon as they got out of slavery, their first thing is, why did you take us out of slavery? We were happy there. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, and now there's no water to drink. And right away, they didn't have water in the desert. And God said, Moses, take that staff and strike the rock. And water gushed out. And the people drank. And there were ongoing rebellions and testings in the desert. And these were the people of God, the people that God had chosen for his special possession. But they were whining again. Now, those of you that have been in ministry know that sometimes that can get frustrating. Sometimes you can get tired. Moses had had to intercede for the people. On multiple occasions, God was ready to just wipe them out and start from scratch. So Moses, just move away from them. I'm going to just wipe them out. Just like during the days of Noah, I'm going to start from scratch with you. And Moses had to intercede for the people over and over and over again. He's been out there for how many years? He's 100 and whatever, 118 years old by now probably. It's getting tiresome. His sister Miriam has just died. And they're whining again. They're complaining why did you do this? Again, the same old story, the same old complaints. And Moses is dealing with it again. He's hearing their complaints. And God says, take the staff and go to the rock. Should bring some bells from the first miracle, right? But this time, just speak to the rock and you will bring water forth for the people. Moses, instead of speaking to the people, he chews them out first, right? You rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? I don't think that was his sin, by the way. And I think we'll see that. But then the Bible says he raised his hand and he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. Twice. Water gushed out. The miracle happened. And then God says, because you have done this, you will not enter the land that I promised my people. Now, to many of us, that might seem a little, little severe, right? Doesn't it seem a little, little harsh? After all that Moses has been through, after all he's suffered, after all he's put up with, that this one mistake of hitting the rock rather than speaking to it should cause such a reaction. It's not even the worst thing Moses done, has done if you think about it. If I remember right, when he came down from the mountain and found them worshiping a golden calf, remember the story? He's coming down with the, the tablets, the Ten Commandments. They seem pretty important, right? Tablets of Ten Commandments written on with the finger of the living God. What does Moses do with them? He throws them down and smashes them. You would think that that would be a pretty serious no-no, right? You would think he would have gotten in trouble for that. But no, God just said, okay, I'll write them again. Come on up and I'll give you a replacement copy. 
So apparently that's okay. He's angry at the people. He was so angry at the people that the Bible says he ground up the golden calf and he put it, the, the dust, well first he burned it, then he ground it into ash dust and then he put it in the water and the Bible says he made them drink it. The, the image I have is just Moses just saying, drink it, drink it, grabbing, so just, psh, how does that taste? How does that taste? Now, I don't know if that's exactly how it all happened, but it certainly seems like he was angry and he really let him have it, but apparently that's okay. Sometimes Moses said things that seemed to be very irreverent. Go with me just a few chapters earlier, Numbers chapter 11. Moses seems to get very frustrated. People are complaining again. They're crying out. They're, each person, the Bible says in number six, uh, Numbers 11, verse 10, it says that Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. <laughs> what an image. Everyone's, they're not just wailing. They're all together at the front door, wailing together. And the Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? Okay, wait a minute. That... That seems a little irreverent, right? Buckle your seatbelts. It gets more interesting. What have I done to displease you, that you have put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Am I their mother? Is basically what he's saying. Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, please just go ahead and kill me if I have found favor in your eyes and do not let me face my own ruin. You can just see the Lord saying, okay, are you done yet? Okay, you got that? Got that off your chest? Yeah, okay. All right, now let's, let's deal with the problem. So apparently, it was okay for him to be really raw with the Lord and tell God how he feels and just put it all out there. But what he did at the rock was somehow qualitatively different and provoked the judgment of God. And what was that? What was the difference? He committed a type of what I would call ministry malpractice a violation of his public role before the people of God. Almost like uh, a, a lieutenant general before the commanding general. You can say anything you want in private, but before the people, we will stand together. You will stand with me, not against me. Let's look at what the Bible says he did. He says, you failed, back to Numbers 20. Back to Numbers 20. It says, because you failed near the end of it, Verse 12, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me, you did not believe in me. That's the same language used of the spies who were supposed to go in and conquer the land and then got afraid and caused a rebellion. It says, because they didn't believe in me, they will not enter the land. Moses had committed the same sin, a lack of faith. And then it goes on to say, it's because you did not believe in me to treat me as holy before the people in the sight of the Israelites, to honor me as holy. The language there is interesting. In the Hebrew, it's because you failed to sanctify me before the Israelites. That's very interesting thought, to sanctify God. That's very mysterious language to me. Isn't God sanctified enough already, right? Isn't God holy, three times holy? How could I possibly add to that? I can't add to the holiness of God. But holiness, we pray for this in the Lord's Prayer every day, don't we? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Sanctified be thy name. It's the same language, just in the Greek. You see, holiness is intrinsic to God in the sense of his moral purity and his holy separateness from everything else. But holiness is also relational. It's how we treat a person or a thing. Uh, holiness could mean you consider something holy. You set it apart for God. You regard a day as holy, an item. In the Old Testament, it talked about regarding the Sabbath as holy, regarding certain items as holy, regarding the priests as holy. And God says, you also, in a relational sense, will regard me as holy 
by obeying me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We honor God by doing it his way and not our way. By saying, God, even though I want to go this way, because you're God, I will recognize your holiness by obeying you and doing it your way, especially in a public role of spiritual leadership. It's the same language used of the sons of Aaron when they brought strange fire before the Lord. You know the account? No, it was after the tabernacle had been consecrated, and the sons of Aaron apparently had drank a little too much, decided to barge into the Holy of Holies unannounced with some strange fire. The Bible says fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And God said, because they failed to recognize me as holy among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. We approach God on his terms, not ours. We stand before God in his way not our way, especially in our public capacity of spiritual leadership. By those who draw near me, I will be treated as holy. There's one final detail to this text, and I have to confess that I cheated. I called my old roommate in seminary. His name is Jay. He, he wrote a little something about Leviticus. You all have to go buy it right away. It's the best commentary ever written on the book of Leviticus. End of plug. Okay. He wrote, he talked about there's a particular terminology used about different types of sin in the, in the law. There's unintentional sin and there's intentional sin. And there is also high-handed sin. That is a type of sin that is insolent in nature, that is rebellious in nature. In the text it says Moses raised his hand, same language, and struck that rock. There was a rebellious quality to it. In the book of Deuteronomy it says, because you and Aaron broke faith with me and didn't honor me as holy before the people of Israel. It's the same word used for a spouse being unfaithful to their husband or wife. It's serious language. It's a betrayal. It's a rebellion before the people of God. If you think about it that way, Moses got off easy, didn't he? Could have been a lot worse than it was. God, before all the people, was making a point. It's, it shocks us. If you were going to write the Bible, would you write the end of Moses' life like this? No, God obviously wrote this, right? Because it's not the happy ending we want. But it's the happy ending we need because it makes a point about who God is and what our role is to be before him. I don't know if anyone's interested in American history. Near the end of World War II, General Douglas MacArthur was considered one of the greatest generals since Washington. During the Korean War, he felt so powerful, so revered, that he started taking matters into his own hands, provoking a war with China that could have easily gone nuclear. And Harry Truman fired him. He says, you may be the greatest general since Washington, but I'm the commander in chief. And that's what God did with Moses. You are the, perhaps the most powerful human being aside from Jesus ever to have walked the face of the earth. But our God is the great king. He abused the staff. Now, I don't want to make a magic item out of the staff. But if you think about the things that the staff of God was used for, no? To make war on the nation of Egypt, to turn into a snake, to do all these amazing things. It, it, it's, it, it's not just a walking stick, and it's certainly not a magic wand, and it is definitely not a club to be wielded in anger. It is a scepter of the great king. And that king has taken his scepter and has entrusted it to you for a little while to exercise his kingdom on earth. And you will handle that with respect and with reverence and with fear and trembling, wielding the staff. He doesn't wield the staff. God wields the staff through you. God wields you through the staff, better put. And we're going to be talking about this. And this rock, not just any rock. In the book of Corinthians, it says the rock that followed them was Christ. This is a prophetic picture of Christ to come, struck, and water comes out to feed his people. And Christ was struck once, not twice, not three times for our sins. This was a severe violation. Now, this is sobering for me as a pastor, and here's where I'm going with this for us, is that 
This text speaks to me about the trust we have as leaders, that we are called into a holy space, into holy moments to represent a holy God. And that is a tremendous, tremendous responsibility. It's also a tremendous privilege. The book of James says those of us who teach will be judged more strictly. It also says we all sin in many ways. Amen? It also says confess your sins to one another so you'll be forgiven. I'm not perfect. I never will be. I make mistakes all the time. But I want to revere the role that God has called us to and value it. I think part of why I was feeling so sentimental as I was driving through those beautiful woods coming up here, I was just thinking, God, I get to be a pastor. <laughs> it's awesome. Pastors and ministers and teachers and Christian counselors, people who exercise spiritual leadership, I want to be very careful. All ministry is holy. I believe in the priesthood of all believers. But a teaching ministry, a leadership ministry, brings you in to holy moments in a special way. We get invited into holy moments where we have the privilege of holding that staff, God's holy word, and using it to help form a holy people. Holy moments. I want to talk about that for a minute. Holy moments. God calls us. For me, a holy moment is a moment when I am present, not just as Greg, but as people's pastor present pastorally to people. It's not about me. It's about the one I represent. It's about what God's doing in their life. I'm not the main character. God is with them. But we get a front row seat to witness the fingerprints of God, what he's doing in the moment, what he's doing in people's lives. And we get to enter into that and witness, the, like it says, what Moses failed to do, to believe that God is present, to believe that he is working, and to know that I get to be part of that. Holy moments. Now, some of those are biggies, right? Weddings, funerals. I bumped into Dr. Swetland in, in, uh, upstairs, and I was like, Dr. Swetland, thank you. Thank you for the class on weddings and funerals. I've had to do lots and lots and lots. Do your homework in the class on weddings and funerals. You're going to be doing a lot of them. It's a great quote, though, because those are holy moments. It's awesome, privilege, if you think about it. Now, if you think about it a certain way, it's just stressful, right? Because you get, especially at the wedding, with all the technology now, you get to be captured on film to be shown to the kids and the grandkids down the generations. Any mistake you made will be remembered by the generations. I get reminded of mistakes. It's only been... If you think about it that way, you're just going to be stressed and tight. That's not what it's about, though. It's about being present to witness something far holier, but it's something that's not about you. And that is actually a relief as a minister. I heard a great quote by Teddy Roosevelt, uh, by his daughter, apparently. I don't remember which one, but she said, My father wants to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. <laughs> Got to be in the middle of everything. Got to be the center of attention. As a minister, you are not the bride. And you are not the corpse. Amen. Let's hope right now you're not the center of attention. But you are present to witness something amazing going on. Wow. I, I love weddings. I love them because, and I'm not really into all the, the stuff, right? Uh, the, the, all the important symbols of a wedding, you know. <laughs> but, you know, but boy, that ceremony. When I am standing there with that couple, I get a front row seat to see two human beings who are entrusted with the tremendous honor of making a covenant, making promises to one another in the presence of God. There are angels watching. And every time I feel God's presence in a special way. And it doesn't matter whether it's with a really wealthy couple. And I've done one that the picture ended up in like some Martha Stewart magazine. And I was in the middle of it somehow. And the, day, the week before, I had done a wedding on a pier in East Boston with a couple where, where it was just me and the couple and a handful of friends and relatives. I met the groom beforehand and taught him how to tie the tie. He had a rose he'd gotten from Stop and Shop. And that wedding felt every bit as holy as the one that ended up in the magazine, amen? Because God is present. And our role as ministers is to sanctify God in the moment, to recognize that he's there, recognize that that makes it special, recognize that he's at work. Funerals? Oh my gosh. The, the holy ground of the grief. 
uh, looking for the fingerprints of God in the life that has been lived and, and God meeting people at that moment where they're facing eternity as they never had. What an awesome, awesome privilege. There's other holy moments. Could be a courtroom when you're sitting next to someone who's finally facing the music for some bad decisions they've made. It could be an immigration appointment where you come out, they finally got that green card, and you get in a circle and you say, thank you, God, you are the king of kings and the lord of lords, and you have opened the door finally. We get to sacralize the moment by pointing to a holy God who makes the moment holy. Now, there's not always going to be exciting background music like in a movie that tells you something special is going on. But in the spirit, there is music in the background. And if we can hear that, wow then all these moments are the holy moments that, and, and the counseling moments in the messiness of human life and all the drama and the ugliness that God is there. God is meeting them. God is doing something. We get to enter into holy moments. That mo moment when people were complaining at the rock was a holy moment when God wanted to show himself holy. And that's why what Moses did was so serious. Holy moments. And in that holy moment, we get to use the holy word of God. This is the staff, folks. This is the staff. I remember one pastor as I was growing up who used to always pray with the Bible over his head before he preached to make the point that the word is more important than me. I have the privilege of preaching it, interpreting it, uh, uh, applying it, but m I must never adapt it, no matter what the pressure. It is what it is. And it certainly must not be wielded in anger or in any kind of personal frustration. We have the privilege of using the word. And a good shepherd doesn't just use the word to guide the sheep, but also can rest on that staff, right? A good shepherd, I think, I'm just using my imagination, I've never shepherded before, but I would assume that their staff is a comforting item for them to hold. I encourage you what you're doing here in seminary, to acquire the taste for the word of God, that savor for the word of God. And that is something that can, it, that you have already acquired or you wouldn't be here, but it can be reacquired and recultivated. I'll never forget as a new student here at Gordon-Conwell, we were at uh, Walmart picking up some, some items with a number of other students. And I was meeting a, a young international student and she was part of the group and I asked her, you know, what are you gonna study while you're here at seminary? And she said, with this thick Australian accent, biblical studies. And I felt the presence of God. <laughs> I don't know, I'll give you 10 guesses who that might have been. <laughs> the passion for the word of God. We can be like that. We, I love that. She had a tremendous impact on me as a student, as did Jay, as did Dave and Christine and Kathy and the Petters. Even as students, they, you know, we are so privileged here at Gordon-Conwell. The faculty doesn't just teach this as an academic thing. There is reverence for the word of God. There is, is a, a savor for the word of God. The way it says in a great book by Chaim Potok, that you can hear the song of Solomon in their voice as they talk about it. I love that. I'm so grateful for what is done here. We can acquire and reacquire that. You can, believe it or not, keep using your Greek and Hebrew in ministry. You can. Now, you don't have to. Not everyone's going, well, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but it is possible, right? <laughs> they just recently, just recently, they came out with the Hebrew Reader's Bible, where they have the um, the vocab at the bottom listed, the UBS Reader's Bible. It's great. So you can just look under a certain frequency. It helps you read it. And I was so excited about this that I went out and I got those flashcards that Dr. Pratico uh, made with Miles Van Pelt, right? Those flashcards. And I'm, and I'm on vacation in LA with my wife and, and the family. And I'm reading these flashcards. And uh, my wife, you know what she, my beloved wife, <laughs> she referred to me as Mr. Nerdy Pants over there. <laughs> <laughs> can you believe that? We can do this. We can get into the Greek and the Hebrew. We can savor the word of God. Great advice given to me as a new pastor, and I'm going to begin bringing it home, is that we are called to give good bread and love people. That's really the bottom line. If we will give good bread and love people, a multitude of other sins get covered. Good bread and love people. And that brings me to my final point recognizing the holiness of the people that God has called us to serve. Now, this is ironic because part of recognizing that God's people are holy is being able to bear with their sinfulness. Isn't that weird? It's counterintuitive. 
You see, just like a doctor deals with sick, sick people, and sick people are going to sneeze on their doctor, maybe, well, pastors deal with sinners. And sometimes, more than sometimes, most of the time, sinners are going to sin all over you. It's going to happen a lot. We can't be easily scandalized. Holiness is not about their moral purity yet, although let's hope they're in process and that we're helping, we're ministering in that process. But it's more about possession. An item was holy in the Old Testament not because it was morally pure, because it had the name, this belongs to Yahweh on it, right? It's possession. And I want to end with a, with a little testimony of a man in my church that I knew since I started there 20 years ago attending who struggled with very severe alcoholism, lived in the shelters. And when he would go down, he would go all the way down. He was the worst of the worst on the street. And me, a white boy from the suburbs, somehow found myself hanging out with him on street corners in Dudley Square and different places, and he's having long, bad nights. You could smell him before you could see him. The worst of the worst. And there came a point, many relapses, where I literally had his eulogy written. I was sure he was going to die. It was that bad. And one night, I was tucking in my daughter. Three years, she was about one and a half at that point. That beautiful moment when she's finally asleep, right? Like asleep. And the lullaby is playing. And the, and the lighting is soft. And I'm looking, and it's just, those are, wow, talk about holy moments, huh? It's a moment where I'm like, God, I just never knew I could love something this much, right? And at that moment, I felt God telling me, that's how I feel about, I'll call him David. That's how I feel about David. That's how I feel about him. He is my son. You remember that. He is holy. Right now, he's not living it. But he is holy because he belongs to me. And you will treat me as holy in his life. Holiness is about belonging to God. Realizing that God's people are, just like the Bible says, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that they might declare the praises of the one who brought them out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once they had not received mercy, but now they've received mercy. And we have the privilege of entering into holy moments and using God's holy word to prepare his holy people. Why would I want to do anything else? Amen? I invite you to stand with me and let's pray. And dear God, I pray in Jesus' name for the men and women before me today, Lord God. And Father, you know the story of each one and what brings them here. And Father, I thank you, Lord God, that you have a destiny for each one to work in your kingdom and to touch lives, to inhabit holy spaces and to use your word to prepare a holy people for you. I pray not just for them, but for the people that are represented by them today. God, I pray that your name would be sanctified through them, that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, through them, in Jesus' name. Amen.